There was another little adoption story, or would-be adoption story as well. A very young girl came into our centre, and she too was concealing her pregnancy. She had felt very much that as she had got herself into this mess, she must be the one to get herself out of the mess, and she could not garner up the courage to go to her family and speak to her parents about her predicament. She was a lovely girl, and I could tell that every time we met that she had a wonderful family who would love her and support her and do everything they could for her and her baby. But she just could not bring herself to speak with her mum. Even though every morning when Dad got up and went to work, she would hop into bed with her mum and they would have a cup of tea together before she went off to Unitech for the day and for her mother, before her mother went off at 7am to go to her daily work. It's hard to imagine, it's hard to believe that a mother could no, not know that her own child was having a baby. But this young girl managed to conce conceal her pregnancy very well. I prayed a lot over those months and every time I saw this young lady, I pleaded with her to go and visit her parents myself or we looked at and explored different ways in which she could actually garner up the courage to talk to her family and she just couldn't. And so we started looking at adoption files and possibilities. But of course, there were no adoptive, prospective adoptive families who that she, you know, that she felt happy with. The day came for her to have her baby. And it was a bittersweet event because she called me and I went up and met Mary, our midwife, at the hospital. And I was present at the birth of this child also. And I fed him. I gave him his first feed. And I named him Samuel while his mum turned her head away and pretended that this nightmare or something magical would happen to make this nightmare go away. It was a joyful occasion to see this little child born, but I was deeply saddened. I felt that I had robbed grandparents of their right, of their duty and responsibility to be there for their child and for their first grandchild. As it happened, the baby wasn't very well and he was underweight and so he needed to stay in hospital, thanks be to God. Um, and so the hospital agreed to take care of the wee baby and every day this young mum would catch the bus and go back up and spend time with this little baby, Samuel. She would be back home in time before her family arrived and still they didn't know that she had just given birth to their grandchild, their grandson. On the morning of day 12, 7.30 a.m. in the morning, so I was just getting our children ready for school to put them in the car and take them to their classes. And the telephone rang, and it was this young lady. Hello, Mrs. Bayer. I've just told my mum and my dad and they're in shock. And, um, and um, well, they're going to take me up to the hospital now to bring baby Samuel home. And I could have fainted on the floor. It was such wonderful, wonderful news. And um, Mrs. Bayer, you know all those baby things you talked about. Um, can you bring them up to the hospital, like now? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I got my running boots on and of course um, loaded up the car with the children, dropped them off and raced up to the hospital. It had a wonderful ending. Um, sometime later, the whole family came into our centre with this beautiful little baby whom they uh, retained the name of Samuel. They christened him, a wonderful Christian family and it was a beautiful, beautiful ending. So again, thank you for helping that uh, make that happen. 
But it did remind me very much of Pope Benedict's words. Even in the most difficult circumstances, human freedom is capable of extraordinary acts of sacrifice and solidarity to welcome the life of a new human being. I know um, I don't want to keep you too long, and I've probably got about six or seven or eight stories here, so I, I won't do that to you. But I will, I will share with you something. In our own family, um, about six years ago, we were um, very, very surprised uh, when a young mother, a very young girl, gave birth to a little, little girl with Down syndrome because of the number of anomalies that this little girl had and the difficulties of this young child herself, we were asked um, and we offered to bring mother and baby into our family to stay for a wee bit because um, SIFs could not find a placement and birth mother did not want her little girl adopted out. And so, um, they came home to us, and of course many of you will know that little Elizabeth is still very, very much a part of our family. I think her picture may have been shown on the screen this evening. They lived with us for several months, and the young mum found it very difficult to live in a normal family situation. And so as time went by, she had things to do and places to go, and uh, so at our um, very mature age, uh, Terry and I adopted into our hearts and our family little Elizabeth Therese. As her little story of life unfolded, it became apparent that she was profoundly deaf, that she needed very, very severe open heart surgery. She is at the high end of ADHD, and she also, um, she's in danger of losing her eyesight because the pressure is continuously building up behind her eye sockets and that's very indicative of uh, childhood glaucoma. She also has um, different colours in her eyes which are also um, indicative of the condition. And those colours are changing which isn't such a great sign for her. She is a very beautiful child, and she is our little missionary of love, as we like to call her. We also have a son, 21, who has Down syndrome, as many of you know. And both Elizabeth and Benjamin have what we have come to know as the love chromosome. They have an extra chromosome, and is known now as the love chromosome, something that you and I can never, ever hope to achieve in our life. These children have a tremendous capacity for giving out unconditional love. They can be very mischievous, yes, but never, never any malice in their life. You will never, ever hear or see a person with Down syndrome speaking untoward about anybody else. They are the light of our lives and uh, we have special, three special children at home who we're very, very proud of. And so I think we understand that every single conceived life is very, very special. And now when we are faced with the maternal screening program that is detecting so many Down syndrome people, of whom 90% of detected unborn children with Down syndrome are being aborted, we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Why is a medical profession, a scientific profession, a legal profession, a political uh, leadership in our country, and as ordinary Joe blogs of this world, why in the name of Almighty God would we want these people annihilated? As I said, they love unconditionally. 
they are very, very close to the very heart of Jesus. They embrace life every day to the fullest. And yet, we as a society are saying it's okay to screen them out of existence. We are denying ourselves of the ability for these people to teach us in our own selfishness, patience, love, understanding, self-giving, self-sacrifice, and every virtue that we can imagine. Why? Why would we do that? I don't understand. There are so many stories that I would like to speak with you this evening. And perhaps, um, just I, w I would talk to you about one more, perhaps, maybe two. A young Catholic girl came to our centre. Her mother had died when she was just 16 years old. She hadn't been brought up in the faith, just baptised as a Catholic. She was very, very lonely and very, very sad. And so she got caught up with a young uh, Muslim gentleman whom she married and she got pregnant and she came to us and didn't know what to do. She didn't really want to have the baby, she was quite ambivalent, etc., etc. The long and the short of it was is that through coming into the centre very, very regularly, through loving her, befriending her and embracing her life, and bringing her through to wholeness, she gave birth to her little baby. But then she found that her Muslim husband was starting to exercise his rights to have more than one wife and to have other children. And so where she has gone to this gentleman for love and family, she has discovered that she can only have little bits and pieces of him so we love her and protect her and we are always there for her whenever she wants to come to our centre. And as I speak to you tonight, um, I am on call. We are waiting for a baby boy to be born. And this little boy has got to adoptive parents anxiously waiting for his birth and have asked me to be there, and I said, well, I can get someone else to be there, you know, it's kind of awkward. Um, our son's just broken his ankle, and he's in a wheelchair, so Dad's at home taking care of him, and blah, blah, blah. But um, they have asked me to be there, so I make myself available, and I will be there for them. And it's very exciting. So I would ask you this evening, too, to pray for the birth mother, who, for her own reasons again and um, feels that she needs to adopt this little boy. Blessed Mother Teresa tells us that when we die, we will come face to face with God, the author of life. Who will give an account to God for the millions and millions of babies who were never allowed the chance to experience loving and being loved and being born. I'd ask you to reflect on that and pray that all of our efforts, all of our collective efforts, all of our young people, everyone internationally that are working for the gospel of life will make those inroads that I spoke about earlier on even more urgent, more passionate, and that we will be a wonderful people of hope of love and of joy. Um, I'm going to finish now because I know it's very late and, you know, enough's enough. But um, thank you very, very much and thank you so much for your support and a huge, huge thank you to the staff, the volunteers and all the friends of life, of family life. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you.